Uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jesus uh, Perez Rios from uh, Stony Brook University, as you can see here. And uh, yeah, uh, Jesus has a very, by comparing to his shorter career so far, I mean, he has been around the world a lot. I mean, he, yeah. he took his PhD degree in, in, in uh, Madrid in 2012 moved on as a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Laboratoire Emile Cotton in uh, Orsay uh, mm -hmm. with Olivier Dulieu as a, a research advisor. From there, you moved to the States, uh, to Purdue University, and uh, in the group of Chris Greens, that at least if some of you guys are atomic, have been involved heavily in atomic physics, you could, uh, theoretical physics, you might recall his name because he's a very famous guy in this field. Uh, in the same, uh, uh, at the same university, you continue then for, for some time in a group of François Aubégeau, um, uh, uh, and uh, then work, went on, uh, that was in 2016, and then in 2017, 18, you, you went to the Universidad del Turabo, <laughs> Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico, yeah, uh, Rico. Uh, where you were an uh, associate professor for, for, for two years there, mm -hmm. and then back to Europe again? Yeah, <laughs> Germany. In the group of uh, uh, Gerhard Meyer at the Fritava Institute uh, of the Max Planck Society in Berlin, uh, which some of you might know, it's really one of the best places in Europe to be. <laughs> so, uh, and stayed there for uh, a few years, three years. And then uh, since uh, last year, you've been at Stony Brook University. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus has uh, yeah, already a very long track record in I'm saying more or less anything you can do with cold atoms and molecules, ions, and uh, so. So even he wrote, wrote a book also, an introduction to cold and also cold chemistry, atoms, molecules, ions, and Rydberg. So, so uh, this topic we're going to hear about today is just one of the many topics that you are touching upon in your research. So please. Yeah. This is, I would say, the, more, the most provocative of what we do. And it's a way to provoke you guys to do science. I like, did be more than what you guys do. Okay? So let's start. In our group, I just want to do some advertise, okay? So we, uh, we do AMO physics, even though I'm going to talk about dark matter, but I will try to show you the connection, okay? And we do theory and computational, right? So we use computers to do simulations because sometimes reality is harder than we expected. And we have four lines of research. One is current local chemistry, as Michael mentioned. We do few-boy physics, where basically we study atmospheric physics, like ozone formation, stuff like that. Then we do data science, where basically we use machine learning techniques to understand better AMO systems. And finally, this is the topic that we're going to discuss today with you guys, is physics beyond the standard model. But, of course, if I mention this, it looks like high energy physics, but we do AMO physics. With the, help, with the hope that we can help these guys from high energy physics, because they're pretty lost. This is my group. No, indeed, they are lost. <laughs> Everyone is lost somehow, right? So this is my wonderful group. So I have two lines. This is the upper line, is the, the guys in the States. Lower line is the guys still in Germany. Because some people don't like the States, so they prefer to stay in, in Europe. So what can I do, okay? So this is my whole group. And today's talk is about the universe, okay? So I'm pretty sure that, you know, every one of you, you go, you know, doesn't matter you are drunk or not, you go outside, you look at the stars, you feel like, oh man, this is beautiful, right? So indeed, this is kind of the motivation that the old philosophers of, even from the very beginning of human history, this is what uh, uh, help us to do science, right? So all the scientific knowledge is coming from curiosity. For me, as an AMO scientist, I can see all bunch of stars, of planets, like atoms and molecules, right? This is the basic bl uh, building blocks of the world as we see it, right? And this is kind of the, the specter of AMO physics. So we, we can go as cold as we like it. It's fine, we have BECs as people here are doing. And also we can go higher in energy up to this energy. At this energy, you break the hydrogen atom and then you have electrons and protons, so then we don't have atomic physics anymore. We go into the high energy regime, okay? This is how I see the, the, the world. But that's a very narrow view. And I cannot do nothing about it, I'm very ignorant. So then we have the honey physicists that say, no, man, we can do even better. We can really, truly understand the fundamentals of physics, okay? And this is the, funda the standard model. This is the most beautiful theory ever made by humankind. Supposed to contain all the information in the universe, okay? And explain everything. That's not true, by the way. But anyway, so we are, we are working through that. So it turns out that all this knowledge, since the very beginning of human history, only contains 4% of the energy of the universe. 
So all the things that you guys do in your lab, all the things that I'm doing, is only 4% of the universe. So every time I see that, I feel really sad. Really, really sad. I mean, I'm, I'm spending my whole life doing this, and, only do, and I can only understand 4% of the universe. What am I doing with, with my life, right? So it's kind of pretty depressing. But this is the way it goes. There's nothing about it. But here's the thing. The idea is like, there are two big chunks that we don't know nothing, dark matter and dark energy. So let's start with dark matter. OK? So what is dark matter? And this talk is about how we can use what we know from atoms and molecules to try to figure out a little bit the properties of dark matter. OK? So let's see what is dark matter. And I will try to convince you that dark matter exists, which most people believe that do not exist. OK? Whatever. This is a free country, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the famous thing about that you have seen, I'm pretty sure, all of you, about the rotation of galaxies, right? So basically, so the rotation of stars. So basically, the idea is to measure the velocity of the stars, right? And then as you are moving farther away, the velocity should be lower, right? This is what you would expect. So basically, you look into the, you look into the core of the galaxy. As you are moving farther away, you have less stars. You have less mass. I mean, the mass is going to a constant. And then you have to go down. But indeed, this is what is observed. OK? And that observation is, uh, it goes with 1 over r squared. So the density is different from what you would expect from the typical visual matter. All the matter that can emit light. And this is the famous thing, OK? <coughs> indeed, you can generalize that to any kind of galaxies. So this is a paper that I got from 1991. People already knew all these things. Then, in order to understand what well, they observe, you need to include the component of the disk, of the halo, and also the gas. Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, we seem to have evidence that there is something out there that <clears throat> is interacting through gravity, but does not emit light. It's something that we cannot see. What is that? Well, we are so original that the name that we came up was dark matter. Not very original, because it's dark. OK, and I'm going to tell you the story about who was the first person to come up with this name. It's a very funny story. Funny and kind of sad, too, I have to say. <coughs> the real story of Dark Marley starts with the comma cluster. In the same way that you can look into the velocity of stars as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy, you can look into the velocity of galaxies in a cluster. So basically, a cluster is a bunch of galaxies that are bound through gravity. OK, so it's a bunch of things orbiting through each other. And then uh, if you are going far away from the, from the system, you have more mass. And then the galaxies here will be much faster than the galaxies over here, right? So you can go and use the Beagle theorem, which I guess that everyone knows about it. If not, it's time to learn, right? And then you can always infer from the velocity what is the mass that your system has, right? So the guys, I mean, the astronomers, not me, go look at the velocity by measuring the Doppler shift of the lines of hydrogen, for instance, and then can see what is the total mass that is in that cluster, right? That's it. This is how it works. So then what it turns out is like the mass that they need to explain the velocity is 400 times more than what they observe. This is a fact. OK, this is not some rational fact. This is no theory. This is no prediction. This is just a fact. And indeed, the guy that did this first was Fritz Zwicky. Sorry, I mean, he's um, Swiss German, OK? But I don't know German. And this guy, in 1933, looking to the comma cluster, proposed for the first time Dunkle Materi. Sorry, sorry for my German, OK? But he was the first one to introduce that term. And you know what happened? No one believed on him. The whole community believed that this guy was crazy. Was so crazy. So he was so crazy that has this wonderful quote. And I like it. Astronomers are spherical bastards. No matter how you look at them, they are just bastards. <laughs> and it is, this is true. And he was very pissed off with them, OK? This is, honestly, this is, and he was very pissed off. And I'm going to tell you something. After this, this guy, I mean, could just you know, start to cry and have some problem. No, the guy was the first one to observe a neutron star. So this guy did all, all his career at Caltech. And he, he's a very, very good astronomer, by the way. But he has some issue with the dark matter. Then the last <coughs> test is to look into the cosmological scale. So <laughs> right now, we start from galaxies. We move to clusters, which is something bigger. And now we are going to look into the whole universe. 
I'm going to show you a simulation called the typical embodied simulation, which is, I didn't do that, it's a very complicated simulation. Basically here what we have is a bunch of baryons, so matter that make us, and a bunch of dark matter. We put it together in a random, or in a random configuration and we let the system evolve. Let's see what happened. So you let the system evolve. Matter like to clamp and form some kind of structure, right? It's beautiful, right, by the way. And now you can see, well, what that means. Well, this is an example, but now this is this famous result for the simulation. So what we have here, this is observation. So this is like the, the, the distribution of clusters of galaxies in the universe. Okay, observation. And this is the simulation. On the model I mentioned before, so you have just a bunch of variants there, you put dark matter, which is something that interacts interact through gravity, and you see that you can match, basically, all the observations. This is pretty impressive, and we're talking about cosmological scale, size of the universe. Indeed, in order to understand this very famous figure, I'm pretty sure some of you have seen that, which is kind of the famous power spectra of the CMB or cosmic microwave background, has these wonderful peaks. So in order to explain those peaks, you need to use what the so-called lambda CDM. Lambda for the cosmological constant of Albert Einstein and called dark matter. So you need to include dark matter in order to explain this. So again, we have a, a observational evidence that dark matter is out there, or at least there's something dark that, is, that we need to include in our models. So now the thing is like, yeah, we know that it's out there, but what is made of? This is the one million dollar question, well, maybe more than one million, but important question. So right now I hope to convince you that we have evidence that dark matter is needed to uh, understand galaxies, cluster of galaxies, and cosmology. So even in all scales, you can explain dark matter. And also you can come up with the idea of modify gravity, right? That's an alternative. However, those theories can only work in one of them. Of course, this one always will fail. You can only use modify gravity to understand the CMB. And this one, it will work. So you can modify gravity, like with a, you have a potential kind to make this guy work. Maybe this, this guy too, but this one is a problem. So, so far, dark matter is the best theory that we have to understand the universe, as the way we see it. Without counting dark energy, that's a different business, and not for today, okay? That's a even harder. I would like to mention this. When I put distance in parsec, even I don't know what is a parsec, right? I know it's big, but I don't know how big it is. <coughs> so, a galaxy is pretty large, right? Way bigger than, than Europe, right? 10 to 17 kilometers is the size of a galaxy. So, we go from 10 to 17 to 10 to the 23 kilometers. So from this scale, it's six orders of magnitude, and still we need dark matter. So we have the same model that can explain everything in six orders of magnitude. This is pretty, pretty robust evidence that we need this guy. And with that, I would like now to pass about how we detect dark matter. Of course, we don't detect dark matter because no one ever sees it, right? Otherwise, you would get the Nobel Prize. So this is the typical approach. From high energy physics, it's like either you do a beam experiment, like having high energy particles, colliding with some kind of material, and then you see if you lose some kind of momentum. If you lose some kind of momentum, it means like there's some kind of invisible particle that you are creating, okay? So that, that particle should be beyond the standard model. Then we have the typical xenon experiment, which is liquid xenon, and then if there is an event such that your xenon gets, uh, gets ionized, then you will see an, a scintillation signal, so like kind of spark. This is how they detect xenon, a xenon experiment. This is the typical approach right now. However, there's something that we have to keep in mind. This is the parameter space for dark matter, and this is one of the main problems. The mass goes, I mean, the mass of dark matter can go from 30 solar masses to 10 to minus 22 EV, okay? So we're talking about more or less 30 orders of magnitude, parameter space. And when you go to uh, accelerators, you can only well, only, I mean, this is a huge chunk of, of it, okay? But you or usually are, uh, you are going to affect this range. What about the rest? What you can do with, I mean, we need new approaches, new machines, new methods to try to explore different mass ranges of dark matter. And one of them is molecules. So why molecules? Because first, molecules are part of the universe, right? So we're here, made our molecules. And also, thanks to the wonderful machinery that you guys have in the lab, you can control molecules very well. 
much better than anyone in the world. So you can prepare guys in a particular quantum state. You can look into interference. You can look at all kinds of different effects. All these things that you guys study are very sensitive to small changes. Time matter is a small change. So then, if you have full control of your system, you are, you are basically sensitive to any kind of weird stuff. And that's the point why molecules are important. Thanks to you guys. And this is the outlook of my talk. I will try to mention what is the principle of the detection. Then I will show you um, our proposal for variational excitation. And finally, we talk about the Migdal effect, which is a kind of funny thing. The principle. The, the principle is fairly simple. Indeed, I start in this business thanks to this paper. This guy, uh, of course, was published in PRD, High Energy Journal. Uh, I was reading that and was like shocked. I always thought, naively, that dark matter is dark, so why should I care, right? It's fine. It, it's a fair statement. Dark matter is mostly dark, but at some point it's not dark. Indeed, this guy's proposed, like, for instance, you have a Let's assume that you have an H2 gas, a gas of hydrogen, so that you can control everything. Let's put it underground, no background, nothing. Then, in principle, hydrogen should be stable, right? But if one of the hydrogen atoms, uh, sorry, hydrogen molecules break down, maybe due to the interaction with neutrinos or maybe with dark matter. So these guys propose that as a way to detect it. And this is something that motivates me. So then, in this paper, 2012, there was the idea, like, if that matter interacts with a molecule, basically, it could happen a vibrational or rotational excitation. And turns out that the typical energy scale for molecular, uh, for, uh, molecular excitation is going to be very good for light dark matter. As a result, since the energy spacing of molecules is very small compared with atoms, we will have a system that can really be, can complement what we can do with typical high energy physics approach, and then we can explore even more. That is why molecules can be very interesting for high energy physics. It's not because they like molecules, they don't care about molecules, they don't care about the system, they only care about having a system sensitive to new stuff. The systems that they are used to work, they cannot go to low masses because the energy of those systems are very high. But molecules are preferred for that. And this talk is dedicated to that. Here, with this plot, I just want to convey the general knowledge. Like we have dark, uh, dark matter colliding with your molecule, something will happen, and then we have different scenarios. Migdal, variational excitation, and then a typical experiment, or mental setup that, that may work, hopefully. Let's see how works the variational excitation. This is pretty simple. So simple that uh, it's always fun to explain. The idea is, is the following. Let's assume that we have a uh, CO gas, okay? Carbon monoxide, something that you can buy in a bottle, right? You put it in a place such that the, all the guys are in the ground state. Okay? You isolate the guy, you put it on the ground, everything, everything's cool. So in principle, all the guys should be in the ground state because there is nothing there that can populate the guy to excited state. Because you are cold enough, so you're in thermal equilibrium. Now, let's assume that it's a dark matter event that collides with your molecule. Now the molecule will, will be excited to some vibrational state. So what happened next? So the idea is the following. You have that tank full of CO, then you just need to attack the photons because the guy will be excited, and when they excite, every time they excite, as much as you have one, two, three, four, or whatever, you will get photons out. If you have photo detector basically surrounding your thing, you always supposed to see darkness, right? You su you're supposed not to see any photon because the guys are, are in the ground state. But if something excites the guy, then you will see the signal coming out as a photons. However, there's something that we have to take care of. Black body radiation is always there, right? Something that can, you know, mess you up, you have to take care of. But it's something that we can work it out. As a result, we can put constraints on the temperature that we need and the density. So we need to have the gas fairly cold. Cold 50 Kelvin, way hotter than what you guys are used to, okay? But this thing is supposed to be big, like meter side, okay? So having a cryostat of one meter side is not trivial. And the density cannot be too high either, because the density is too high, basically, what can happen is like you can quench the excitation via collision with another molecule. I would want to avoid collisional quenching, right? So we want to have pure photonic emission. Okay? So now I'm going to describe the two main processes that can happen. Let's start with this one. This one we call the cascade process. And it's in a condition such that the, the guy goes to this state, for instance, and then the density is such that it's so low that the guy has time to decay to another, another, another. So basically, the guy is cascading because there's no collision. It's very low density. The guy keeps going down, down, 
and then every time you go down, you emit a photon with different frequency. And this is the cascade signal. It can happen, on the other hand, that you can be in the opposite regime. You can still have an excitation to the same state, but turns out that now you have collisions. These collisions are going to quench your system, right? So you start with guy n, zero. Now this guy will go with one. This guy will go one down. So you reduce one, you go up one, uh, like that. And there's something cool. You can keep doing that with another guy, another guy, another guy. But at the end, they will go to the V equal one. So we choose the density or the pressure, whatever you prefer, such that you cannot quench this guy. So all the things will accumulate until you get the V equal one. So you have a V equal to n, you have n excitations in the V equal one. And then you will emit it and get it down and collect it with your IR photo detector, single photo detector, okay? That's another business for another talk how to design these things. But that basically are the two ways how we can detect the signals. Here is an example of how it looks like an effect, a typical signal. Here we have the vibrational states of the CO, and this is the rotational states of CO. Let's assume that the guy starts over here. So in this region, the vibrational quenching is very inefficient, so the, the guy will have cascade. So you go in cascade like that. At this time, now, the collisions are effective because now you are in a vibrational state where, where it can quench easily. So then the guys start to quench, 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 and then you accumulate, and then you get all these guys out. This is another effect. For instance, you have another event here. This is what you have. So basically, in the way how we design the things, like no matter what happens, you have photons out. You can read them. And more than one, so you, you can measure coincidence, and in that way, you can get almost background-free signal. And this is the benefit of using molecules, in particular CO. We use CO because CO doesn't like to quench. CO is a pretty weird molecule. Even CO has a lower quench, uh, uh, cross-section for quenching than H2. CO is amazing, doesn't, look, doesn't like to quench, which is something we like too. And this is at the end what we get. So this is our, our prediction. Here, what we have in the y-axis is the cross-section between the dark matter. Doesn't matter what kind of model it is, because we are not interested in that. What we're interested in is like, what is the minimum cross-section between something colliding with the, our nuclei such that we can, can be sensitive to, as a function of the mass of that thing. And here, in gray, we have things that have been already ruled out by astrophysical observations, seen on experiments, some other things. As you can see, there's a big chunk of the parameter space that has not been ruled out. Using our setup, we can be sensitive to this region with something decent, like 20 centimeters side, an area of one centimeter squared. It's something that it can be done right now. It would be hard, but it can be done. Then, of course, in this business, you always can go to futuristic things, right? Let's assume that now we have a volume of two meters side. That's maybe too futuristic to be true, but anyway, we can do it, right? We are, we are theoreticians. You go to two meters, and then the area is one meter square. In that case, for the photo detector, in this case, we can go as low as this. So we can be sensitive to a huge chunk of the parameter space, which again is something very, is something that you, you, you cannot do with other systems. Another benefit of molecules is the spin. We can play with different isotopes, right? You have carbon 13, you can have different isotopes of, of oxygen if, if you like it. As a result, you can be sensitive to a spin-independent or spin-dependent interaction. You can interact with the spin of the neutron, the spin of the proton. As a result, you can be sensitive to even more dark matter models. That's for vibration. Now we're going to go to the Migdal effect. How many of you know what is the Migdal effect? No one, right? It's okay. I mean, you don't have to know. I didn't know until a year ago, okay? So it's fine. <laughs> So this is something that is funny. Migdal effect. Migdal was a guy, wrote the paper in 1930-something. I, I tried to get the paper, what is in, is in Russian. I don't understand Russian, so I cannot show to you guys. So the idea was the following. He was envisioning this, the following problem. I have an atom, by, by, but the nuclei is going to be radioactive. I'm going to decay through a beta decay. So now the guy goes to a beta decay, so then the neutron goes to a proton, we have a neutrino and an electron, right? So basically, your guy will get out one electron. An electron will fly out. As a result, your nuclei will get a recoil, right? Because your electron is going out, then you have a recoil. If the recoil happens too fast, even you can ionize the atom. 
That's the amygdala effect because you're charged, your nuclei is moving on time. So you have a time dependent type of moment, right? So that's kind of a look at it like a microwave field, so you can ionize or even excite electrons. This is the amygdala effect. He did it, of course, for this particular nuclear uh, reactive decay. But now we can do it with dark matter. Now the question that we have is like, what happens if instead of have a uh, reactive decay, we have dark matter colliding with, a, with an atom, let's say, but the recoil is so fast, so it collides and it's so fast that it can even ionize or excite your atom or your molecule in this case. And this is what we study. So what we did here is we generalized the idea of migdal to molecules, okay? And it was pretty, pretty fun, to be honest. So the idea is like instead to go from one state to another in an atom, now we go from one potential energy curve to another. And now we have different relational states, as you know, different states, okay? And then this recoil can give you from one guy to another. Let's see how that goes. In order to calculate the probability, sorry, this is a bunch of math, but I, um, you should be able to handle it, okay? If not, tell me, please. I will try to make it simple. This is fairly simple. In order to calculate what is the probability to end up in one electronic state, is the following. It's just the overlap between the initial wave function, which you control in your initial state that you're preparing your gas, right? To the final state. And now you have these two guys over here, which is basically plane wave, which is basically like what happens when you have a kick, and these guys are moving. You have different coefficients depending on the, that depends on the properties of the nuclei. Okay, and Q here is the momentum transfer. That's the momentum that the dark matter is transferring to your guys. So now we can write the position of my nuclei in terms of the center of mass, the relative distance, and the position of the electrons. I do that, I put it back, and this is what I got. I got that the probability can separated as expected in two terms. One is pure nuclear, which is just a bunch of vibrational coupling. We don't care, like kind of frank quantum factor business. But then we have an electronic coupling here. Let's see how that looks like. I'm pretty sure some of you already know the answer, right? People doing quantum optics should know that. So what we have here is like this guy. Basically, it's the same as this. We have a penalty over here, which is the mass of the electron versus the mass of the molecule. That is on, so usually you will get this like zero, this is very small, but in our case we care. Then we have the momentum transfer, and then we have this guy over here. This guy over here is the transitional type of moment between the excitation. So this is basically the same as having like a typical transition between that guy and that guy, okay? And then they have the same selection rules as you have for E1, the same selection rules like a dipole allows transition. But the transition is triggered by a dark matter event, okay? Now the middle effect is, has a, another term, and it's the following. We can never forget that the electronic state is not a pure state. What I mean, like pure, like what we call, the state is a single sigma. It's not really a single sigma, it has some component with other guys, right? The quality of the quantum number that you have depends on the validity of the Borobenheimer approximation. But we can always go beyond Borobenheimer and then we can use non-adiabatic effects. When we have non-adiabatic effects, basically we can, we will have a final wave function plus some kind of new component from other guys because we need to see how this electron state couples with the rest. Using pert secondary perturbation theory, we see that we can compute that excess or that combination wave function like that. And this delta V is just the gradient of the nuclear wave function times the gradient in the real direction. So when you apply that, at the end what you get is like the new chunk of wave function that is shared with other electronic states is this thing over here, where this guy is the non-adiabatic coupling term, which is basically what you expect. It's just the coupling between your electronic state and the gradient of the electronic state. Sandwich, this is what you get. And this is what we calculate, or I calculate. High physicists don't care about how to do that. This is what I do. This is my job. So this is the amplitude for the transition. And how we calculate that is through quantum chemistry. So what I do is I try a different basic set that makes sense for the molecule at hand, in this case CO and 2, whatever. Then I, play, I optimize the geometry. I choose a different method. Usually I use MRCI. And then type of calculation. Then we do a, a single point, and then we do electronic overlap. 
we have, we have to do a single point to calculate numerically the gradient, and the overlap is necessary to know what is the probability, right? Because we have the sandwich between the wave function and the gradient of the wave function at a different point. And this is what we have as a result. So this is, for instance, for CO. This is the so-called daily mod modulation. This is the modulation that you will expect to have in a dark matter signal just because we are, uh, uh, just because the rotation of Earth. So we have a daily modulation, as you see, and it's very large for both cases. For the center of mass, in this case, and also for the non adiabatic coupling. And what is more important is this graph. In this graph, I'm showing the neutron, I mean, the, the dark matter, or in this case, anything colliding with your nuclei as a function of the mass of that thing. And as you can see here, this is the state of the art. This is what people have predicted as the best thing. Now they are trying to use silicon. So they, they predict to use uh, semiconductors to detect dark matter because then after dark matter event, you can excite an electron from the balance band to the conducting band, okay? So our guy, N2, is over here, not very good, but CO is as good as semiconductors. So when I'm saying, like, if you use a CO detector as the one that we propose, we can beat or it be as good as semiconductor devices. And they have a different technicalities, but we are competitive with them. So again, molecules are really good and can be a potential good candidate to detect our matter in this range of mass. But you know what is even more funny? Migdal proposed the Migdal effect in 1930-something. No one ever measured that effect in atoms or molecules. That's funny. So yeah, that's right. No one ever, uh, I don't know how to explain this, no one ever tried to systematically study how Migdal effect appears. One way to do it is through neutrons. Neutrons is the closest thing that we have to a dark matter, right? Kind of, it's neutral, so do not interact with the charge, right? Basically, do not interact with anything, and as long as you are far away from any nuclear resonance for fission or fusion, you are good to go. And this is what we are trying to do. So we are proposing now in the Overreach National Lab, we are trying to, de uh, to design an experiment such that we can really measure the Migdal effect. And with that, calibrate our proposal to build the real detector for dark matter. The idea is the following. We have a gas of CO molecules, and we have a neutron beam, very low energy. It has to go low energy because we, cannot, we don't want to ionize CO. So the neutrons have to be low. They need to be. That's not a problem. You guys can't do it. There's only two things, in, three or four labs in the state that can do that. It's a very complicated and expensive thing, and you have to go there. So there's nothing that you can build into a lab with neutrons. So the idea is like now we're going to go from here to there. But the benefit of the Migdal effect, the non adiabatic coupling, like you go to a state with different symmetry. So what it means is like, when you excite a guy, it, it may decay to an intermediate state, and this signal is unique. This photon is of resonant with any transition from the ground state to another guy. What it means is like you have a background-free detection scheme. Then you put all this with UV photo detector, which are fairly simple, way easier than IR photons to detect. So it's using photon multipliers that can work. And then the good thing is like we can do it even at room temperature because we only care about vibrational excitation. We don't care about rotation. So even if the gas is rot rotationally hot, we don't care. We are good to go. And then we, we can do it in high pressure. We don't care about collision as long as we don't quench the electronic state. So we have to be, again, sure, like the lifetime of this guy is short, like it, it's, it's way longer than the typical collision time. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Otherwise, the guy will decay, okay? So now to conclude, it's like, I hope to convince that molecules and gas phase are potential to become an effective thermal detector. We are sensitive to spin and spin independent, the molecular mechanical effect, incorporating non elevatic effects. An important thing is like we have a daily modulation, as I mentioned, also directionality, and didn't put a point of that because you guys don't care much about directionality. But the good thing is like, if you align your molecules, let's say when I to feel or something like that, then you can see where, that, where the momentum transfer happened. And then you can see where the direction of dark matter, because we don't know what is the direction of dark matter. We know that we are moving in the galaxy, right? Because the, the solar system is moving with the sun, in the arm of the galaxy, we know what is the velocity, but we don't know what is the direction of dark matter. And that's something that, that, that can help us. And to that, I would like to say, like, maybe we can work together. Amo physicists and high physicists. At least I'm doing that. I'm having a lot of fun. 
Uh, I hope that you guys can also do that. Indeed, Michael already did something about high vision spectroscopy, and so far so good, right? Um, I guess that he cannot complain. And now, I will use five minutes. This is another thing that we do. So we just published a physics report on this thing. Uh, this is one of the models for dark matter, okay? Or physical standard model. Like this, this is, again, an assumption. Okay, you can believe it or not, it's up to you. Standard model particles, everyone believe on that, right? Then we have the, the, what, the so-called hidden sector. Hidden sector is a bunch of weird things that, we, that are in the dark side. We don't know, I mean, we cannot see them. But somehow, there's a portal that looks like very science fiction, right? But it is true, <laughs> this is a real model, okay? There's some portal, different ways to connect the unknown to the known world. Because somehow, in our world, we should see some evidence of this unknown world. And based on the portals, we can put constraints on how important is, are these guys. And it's something that Michael did. So the idea is like, let's say that you have a bunch of molecules in our system, but if there is something out there, there's some kind of vibration or field going through that, so basically your molecules will feel it. So now you go and do high precision spectroscopy, your atoms and molecules, you should be able to see or to measure the effects of these weird things that you're not aware of. In our case, we choose positronium, which is a fairly simple system. It's just the bound state of a positron and an electron. Fairly simple, okay? And what happened is the following. We have the singlet and the triplet. Triplets are long-lived and singlet. These guys annihilate super fast, they're not good. But then what happened is like, in the experiment, they can measure these transitions very, very accurately. In the same way that Michael did in his experiment. But now we can also put constraints on different more like action like particles or any kind of fit for that you want because they can measure this really well, and then based on that, we can see how, we can, how this thing can be realistic or not. This is an example. Let's assume that we have a, a scalar interaction. I'm going to assume that they have a, something out there which interacts with a scalar field, okay? Then this is what we got. So we have the PS bounds, so the positronium bounds, and this is the, the G2 of the electron, so the geromagnetic factor of the electron. As you can see, the G2 of the electron is much better than positronium. So long story short, you want to put constraints on this, use G2 of the electron, non positronium It's not good. We can go assuming, and then what we have? The following. We have the same as before, this guy, where was, but then we have this dashed line. This dashed line is like if we use reverse states of positronium. You can also do that, okay? People can do that, but we don't gain much, okay? So the thing is like, if you really want to compete with this guy, they should be able to measure lines in positronium with 100 hertz precision, which is way beyond they can do right now. Right now, the David Cassidy can do 100 kilohertz. That's the best. So long story short, it's hard that positronium is going to be useful for physics beyond a standard model, with this scalar model at least. Okay, then we can do the same for action like particles, which is kind of a spin-spin interaction. And again, long story short, D2 is much better than the, than the, than the positron. In this case, again, we have to go like very, very high precision, something that now they cannot do it. Maybe in 10 years they could, but maybe it's no point to go, to go for different splittings. And just to finalize, I would like to advertise this, right, Michael? You remember that? Um, I invite him to contribute to this, but he keeps forgetting, it's fine. Um, so we start, I mean, this is a field that now is growing, at least in the States, there is, even in demo, there is a new topical group about uh, high precision. And basically, they, there's a bunch of people, experimental editions, they measure things really, really, really accurate. And with that, they can put constraints on many crazy things that you can imagine. One of them is their model. So based on that, and also my, I mean, what we like, we start this uh, Cambridge Elements on physics in the standard model um, with atomic molecular system. And this is open to anyone to contribute, okay? It's kind of, these Cambridge elements is like a, something in between a chapter and a review. It has something about your personal view of the field, and it has some, something about a review of the, the field. And this is open to anyone, and I invite Michael, I hope that he can contribute someday. And this is just a way, it's a way to advertise what we are doing in this direction, so such that AMO and Heine physics can work together, holding their hands, I hope. And just to finalize, I would like to say, that I would like to thank Professor Michael Drusen for the invitation, all of you, and the funding, and I feel like I can't, like a kidney can't store. Thank you very much. <laughs>